ready to get into the Word this morning? We'll try not to stay too long in it. It's already at 11 o'clock. We've been teaching about uh, David and Goliath and about uh, David being able to kill the outward giants, but the inward giants were, were too much for him to handle. Amen? And so we're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 5. That's been our scripture. 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 5. Father, I thank you for your word. We release our faith to be changed, to believe, to receive a word from you today. I believe for utterance to come out of my mouth that your word will go forth and change our lives. In my weakness, Lord, make me strong. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Verse 5 says, Because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Now, how many of y'all know what the story is about Uriah the Hittite? We've been talking about it for several weeks, okay? So th- after about 50 years, the first 50 years of David's life, he did try his best. He obeyed God. He was out doing God's business. He was out doing what God called him to do. But in this case... He got on the roof. How many of you know the story about the roof? So let's talk a little bit about what we've learned here. When you're on the roof, you're probably in the wrong place. Amen? Amen. Right? So you've got to acknowledge that there are rules to life. There there are guidelines to life. There are principles from the Word of God. And we, we need to be men and women and boys and girls of the book. And learn the principles of the book. And with the principles of the book, and I don't want to say the laws, but with kind of the rules, the principles, what the book teaches us to do, when God says to do it, we should do it. We should say yes. Amen? And when God says don't do it, we should say no, right? That's real complicated, isn't it? So there's guidelines to life when you walk with Jesus. Amen? He says narrow is the gate. A narrow gate means it restrains us, it it holds us, it keeps us going in a certain direction. But broad is the way that leads to destruction. When you just go anywhere you want, do what you want anywhere, you're going to end up having some problems. Amen? Amen. So we're not talking about living by the law, but you need to know the law. You need to know the principles of God. Amen? The Ten Commandments are worth memorizing. How many of y'all know the Ten Commandments by heart? A few people may. Most Christians don't. And just because there's grace doesn't mean you don't need to know the commandments because when you know the commandments, you know why the grace is so important. So we do have guidelines. But thank God for the throne of grace. Thank God for for a high priest named Jesus Christ who can sympathize with us in our weaknesses because he he became a man and was tempted just like us. Tempted. And he knows how hard it was. In the Garden of Gethsemane, you know what he did? He said, my God, my God, if it's possible for this cup to pass me by. That was that human part of him saying, God, death. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But death, you're asking me to die, Father? You're asking me to die for them? And he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. How about when he was on, uh, in the wilderness, right after he got baptized in the Holy Spirit and baptized in water, and the Spirit leads him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And after he ate, didn't eat for 40 days, the devil says, turn those stones to bread. You can eat, you can do this. If you be the Son of God, tempted. Took him up on a high place, oh, like a rooftop. Said, throw yourself down from here. If you're the Son of God, the angels are going to catch you. That's what the Word of God says, as the, de- the, the devil said it. Quoting scripture to Jesus. He said, I'm not going to tempt the Lord. I'm not going to be disobedient just because I know he can catch me. That's grace. So he was tempted, though. I can guarantee he was tempted. Because the temptations had to be real for them to be called the three temptations in the wilderness. He took him up on a high place, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he says, if you just bow down and worship me, the devil said. He said, nope, I'm going to worship the Lord God and Him alone I'm going to serve. So when we get up on these high places, watch out, temptation is on the way. 
Right when you get saved, like right when he came up out of the water and the Lord looked at him and said, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. All of a sudden the devil said, if you're the son of God, then do this. If you really believe that's, that's who you are, then do these things. So once you get saved, all of a sudden, saved, forgiven, you're nothing but a rotten old sinner. No, you're a saved person that sins. You're not a rotten old sinner no more. You're a sanctified saint. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, are you saved? Now answer the question. Are you? Then to, if they said yes, then say, you're a saint. Wow. See, we don't believe that because we've been taught saints are something else. Amen. Saints are just sons and daughters of God that have been sanctified, set apart to God's God's calling. We're, we're, we're the saints in the earth. We're the body of Christ. Amen? We've got to begin to believe the book. We've got to be people of the book. And so once we know that, when, when you find yourself up on the roof, remember that there are guidelines, there are principles, there's the Word of God that is written to you, and He wrote it to you and for you to read it, and you can understand it. God's given you His Holy Spirit to teach you what the book says. I was ministering to some people last week, some elderly people. I ain't going to say what religion they are. You can probably figure it out. But they were told, you'll never understand that book. You read too much of that. It's going to make you crazy. <laughs> and then they said, and the church I go to, we don't bring our Bibles. Like they were proud of that. We, we read out of other books, the little things at church. They, they really believed that no one could understand the Bible. Why would God write a book to us that we couldn't understand? Amen. No, the enemy has intervened and tried to make it complicated and, and start all of these rumors and stuff about the Word of God saying you can't understand it. Amen? Temptation. You get on the roof, temptation is going to come. And you better know to say yes to what God says and to say no to what God says. Amen? Amen? But you know our human nature is when we're told no, we've got to find out why we can't. Amen? Yeah. You know, we had, to, we had uh, 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 the, the T-Bayous, we used to call her, down the mountain where we'd play, me and Tony. And they had some cows out there and some big old bulls. And at certain times of the year, them bulls didn't like you being in their field. And so when Daddy would say, y'all don't need to be going across that fence over there, the neighbors over there, and they, well, why, Dad? You just don't need to go. I told you no. Well, we're going to go find out why. So we crossed the fence. <laughs> you get on the other side of the fence and... <laughs> <laughs> Thank God he kept, he kept the bulls up in the front where they were. On, so we had a little place to play, but don't go over that fence on that side where those bulls were. But you know what? We had to test it. And back then, it wasn't good for me. I was the littlest one, shortest leg, slowest one. So they didn't have to outrun the bull. They just had to outrun me. <laughs> Isn't it amazing whenever we hear, don't go there. Don't go over that fence. Don't, don't climb over that wall. Well, we've got to see what's on the other side of the wall. <laughs> Temptation. We don't like guidelines. We don't like someone to say no. Listen, if you're married, one of the things that causes a lot of arguments in your household is saying no. Somebody wants something to say, no, you can't have that. What do you mean, no? <laughs> no. And it goes both ways. It's not just the husband. It's, it's both ways. We've got to learn how to accept no. I, I, I taught you all this, I think, a week or two ago. I said, try telling yourself no more. How many of y'all tried that? <laughs> not one of y'all. <laughs> Do y'all remember me saying that? <laughs> Whenever you've already eaten, you, you had your appetizer, and now you had your entree, and they come, would you like some ice cream too? No. <laughs> tell yourself no. And then there's sometimes you need to tell yourself yes. 
Because some of y'all are just the opposite. You've done things wrong and you've no God forgave you, but you didn't forgive yourself, so you don't think you deserve anything. How about that? See how it, we, we go both sides. That's why we've got to believe what God says about us and understand that what he died for us on the cross for, it belongs to us. So when you're out there and you thought you did something wrong last week and we say we want to pray for you, you have a need, you say, well, God ain't going to answer my prayer. I sinned. Well, all of sin, and if it takes not sinning to get your prayer answered, none of us would get our prayers answered. You've got to believe in His grace and His mercy. You've got to boldly come to the throne of grace because your high priest sympathizes with you. And David understood this principle. But in, except in the case of Uriah, with his affair with Bathsheba. So he's on the roof and he should have had the word of God in his heart and should have said no to certain things and ran and got off the roof. Amen? And uh, listen, and number three, once you find out you're in the wrong place, get off the roof. It's not like you, you're on the roof and you, you find out, hey, I shouldn't be here, and you hang around a little bit longer. Get off the roof and get about what God's called you to do. Get back into the battle. Get back into loving others. Get back into fulfilling the great commission and the great commandment. It's really not that complicated but how many of you know we're all flesh and we all, we're spirit and flesh? Those two war against each other. So you've got to feed your flesh. Why? So you can have substance, but you've got to feed your spirit so that you can have strength with God's Word. Amen. And if you only feed your spirit on Sunday morning, you're starving. Amen. If you only feed it on Sunday morning and Wednesday night, and let me tell you, on Wednesday night, there's not this many people here. Because we're watching The Voice or something else. We're feeding it with something else. Guys, they got things now called DVRs. Amen. That you don't have to miss church to watch your TV. You know? Amen? Priorities. And then really every day you should be eating at the Word of God. Reading the Word of God. And you can understand it. It will change your life. Amen? Amen. Praying. Seeking God, fasting at times. Ooh, Cajuns don't like to fast. I'll be one of them. Amen? Let's go to Psalms now. I want to go to Psalms 51 this morning. Verse 1. What an awesome psalm. This is the psalm that David wrote after he found out that he had sinned. Once he acknowledged his sin... David wrote this psalm. After Nathan confronted him and told the story about, you know, this rich man had everything he wanted. He had all the, all the sheep he needed, and his neighbor had one little lamb. And whenever the traveler came through, instead of taking from his own flock, he went to the neighbor who was poor and only had one lamb, took that one lamb and, and, and uh, killed it, slaughtered it to have a feast for the traveler. And this was a lamb that was raised in this, his neighbor's house. He treated it like a child. And David gets really upset and says, that man ought to die. And Nathan looks at him and says, you're the man. You see? And that, that's when, whenever the prophet, the man of God says, by the word of God, you're the one. And, and David saw it was him. And he repented. And he, he started to turn his life around, but he still had consequences, right? You can choose to go in, on the roof and and goof off if you want, but you're not going to choose the consequences of your goofing off. Amen? But God is still gracious and merciful. Amen? So when he gets, gets the revelation that he sinned, he realizes even though he sinned against Bathsheba and sinned against Uriah, the whole deal here, here is his relationship with God, with God was more important. He found out for this whole year that he had been playing around. He wasn't really having a true, close relationship, fellowship with God. And so he writes this psalm. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercy. Say tender mercy. tender mercy. So what's he saying? Lord, have mercy on me. Don't judge me. Don't give me what I deserve. 
And you know, he, he deserved death. I mean, when we sin, when you commit adultery, you're supposed to be stoned to death. Don't give me what I deserve, God. Have mercy on me. You know why? Because I know you're a loving God according to your loving kindness, according to your tender mercy. The multitude of your tender mercy. Blot out my transgression. You know why? Only God can blot it out. Amen. And let me tell you, Blotting it out means he'll never read it again. He'll, he'll cleanse it. He'll take it away. And, and you know what? David, after dealing with this in his conscience for a year, he was so tired of probably hiding his sin. How many of you know it's miserable when you hide your sin? Or you justify your sin. You rationalize your sin. You do like Adam in the garden. God, it's not me. It's that woman you gave me. It's you and that woman. He was blaming God and the woman. Rationalize what, what you did. And then the woman says, the devil made me do it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Blaming somebody, not taking responsibility. He wants it blotted out because you know what? It's on his mind. It's, it's, it's in his mind. It's in his heart. It, it, that sin has got him. But guess what? He's getting delivered. Look at the next scripture too. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. He wants to be completely washed. Cleanse me from my sin. Now, if you want your sin, you can keep your sin. But your sin is going to destroy you. When it's full grown, it's going to bring forth death. Amen. Amen. So you've got to actually put action to this. It starts with words, but let me tell you, it's going to come into where you've got to do actions with it. Faith without works is dead. To be a hearer of the word and, and not a doer of the word, you deceive yourself. You don't need a devil to deceive you. You're deceiving yourself if you want to still hold on to your sin and live with your sin. It will consume you. It's like taking fire to your chest and holding it and not thinking you're going to get burned. Is what one of the Proverbs says. Cleanse me from my sin. Wash me from my iniquity. Look at the next scripture. Three. For I acknowledge my transgressions. And my sin is always before me. See, it, now it's, he, it, he knows it was always there. He tried to hide it. He tried to cover it up. He tried to pretend that he didn't sin. But it was still there. Amen? It was still on his conscience. It was still bothering his heart. Amen. Let me turn there in my own Bible. I write in my Bible, so a lot of my notes are in my Bible. So he says, For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is forever before, ever before me. Now in 1 John 1, 9, it says, Confess your sin to God, and He is faithful and just to forgive your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It's like you're talking to somebody who says, how's, how's things with your life? How's things with your soul? Oh, well, Pastor... Uh, I know I need to go, go to confession. Well, get on your knees and start confessing. Amen. What would happen if you couldn't find a priest to confess to? Would your sins not be forgiven? Get before God, get on your face and confess your sin to God. And in this psalm right here, he's not confessing to man, he's confessing to God. Amen. you got to watch who you tell other, who you're telling about your sin. Not everybody needs to know your business. There's some people that act like they know all of your business and they don't even know you at all. Did you see, you heard about Pastor Mark? Oh, somebody saw him. But did you see him? No, but somebody told me they saw him. Gossip. And even if you did see, who are you supposed to come to? Me. Tongues. Gossiping. It's another, another thing. But that's a sin too. Y'all know that, huh? There's some people, they don't have a relationship with other people unless they're talking about somebody else. Did y'all get that? The only time you, go to, you go to fellowship with them, there's nothing to talk about unless you talk about somebody else. That's not fellowship. And then he says, he says I, I, I want to acknowledge it. I've got to bring it out. For my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only, and you only, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. He's talking about 
his adulterous affair and killing Uriah. And he says, it's against you, God of sin, and you only. He makes it about his relationship and reconciliation with God. We sin against others and, and we need to make restitution if we can. But you've got to start right here. You've got to bring it to God and start obeying what God tells you to do. Amen? Mm. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. That you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. In other words, whatever comes on me, God, it, it's, it's in your hands and you're going to be just. You're going to be a just God. He says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Now some theologians and some people try to say that, that Jesse's wife was unfaithful and David wasn't really the son of Jesse, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about everybody is born with this original sin. You come into this world with a sin. Even when you're conceived, you were conceived, you have sin in your members, that iniquity, that bent to do what's wrong. You know, don't believe me? You can take a, a baby that's one-year-old, two-year-old. They say, mine! Huh? They, 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 it's all about them. <laughs> and they need to come to the revelation that they need Jesus Christ. And it takes a good parent to help them get there, right? So we have that sin in us. And then he says, behold, you desire truth in my inward parts. God wants you to be changed on the inside, the inward man, renewed in the inward man. And in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Come on, when you start confessing, God starts getting on the inside. He starts changing us from inside out. Religion wants to change you from outside in. God wants to change you from the inside out. Start confessing your sin to God. Can acknowledge it. He already knows. When you're hiding behind the tree, He was already there. You can't hide from God. Amen? Everything is laid before Him naked and open, the Scripture says. He says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Then he says in verse 8, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. How I many know God will allow us to be broken so we can get on our knees and start to repent so that we can rejoice again? True repentance brings refreshing. Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted, be converted that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Another one, he says, turn at my reproof, and I will make my word known to you and pour out my spirit upon you. When we repent, we get refreshed. Joy will return again. If you've lost your joy, maybe you're just being too stubborn to repent. Amen? Amen. Too prideful to repent. Can I be honest with you? When I made that altar call earlier, there should have been a lot more people that get up and come forward than just this one young man that had the courage to come forward. Because we're so worried about what everybody else thinks, we're going to walk out of here still carrying a little weight on us because we're afraid to confess our sin in front of other people because they, oh, I wonder what he did last week. <laughs> Whoever's looking at you that way, they're the one that's got the biggest problem. You're wondering what they did? You better look at what you did or what you didn't do. There's sins of commission and omission. Amen? See, the scribes and the Pharisees and all those religious people, they, they thought they had it all together, so they were judging everybody else, even Jesus. He even said, he's got a demon. But he was casting out demons. So he cast out demons, he would heal the sick, and they said, well, he's doing it because he's got the ruler of demons on the inside of him. Well, that, that's true, but it wasn't a demon, it was the presence of God in him. He could walk on, he could trample on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. Now, I love this. He says, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. So the brokenness in us can bring rejoicing. Amen. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquities. I, I don't want God to keep looking at my sin. I want him to look at my faith. I want him to look at me through what Jesus did on the cross. And believe me, God sees you differently than you see yourself. Amen. He sees you forgiven. He sees you through the sacrifice of his son. Isn't that amazing? In fact, he sees you delivered, healed, saved. Come on. 
There's power in what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And this is where I love it. Create in me a clean heart, O God. In other words, the Creator is the only one that can change your heart. So you've got to bring your heart to God. If something's going on in your life, don't run from God. Bring your heart to God. And this is the same word used in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, like us when we're broken and sinful. And darkness was on the face of the deep. When we're in sin, it's like darkness is all over us. Amen? And it says the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, was ho hovering over the face of the waters. Let me tell you, the Holy Spirit right now is hovering over us. Amen. And then God said, God's Word, Let there be light. Creation came and there was light. Come on, His Word is a lamp into my feet. It's a light in my path. I need to start walking in the light, living in the light. Amen? Amen? Having fellowship in the light. And it says in that same scripture in, in 1 John, this is verse 7, 9 says confess your sin, but 7 says if you walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship with one another, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And that, that in, in the uh, Greek it's continually cleansing us. Thank God for the blood. Amen. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. I, I, I've done that before on my knees just out under the tree, walking in the back, and I'll be praying about something. I just said, God, just create, create in me a clean heart, oh God. Take out that heart of stone and give me that heart of flesh. Make my heart tender again. Renew a steadfast spirit in me, within me. And he says, do not cast me away from your presence. And I think this was the number one thing for him. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. In other words, after all what's going on, yeah, he messed up with Bathsheba. Yeah, Uriah's dead, but he's more worried about being without the presence of God. Not looking good before people. That's why we need Jesus. All of the things we've done to hurt other people, injure other people, and people that maybe injured us, they can't fix it and you can't fix it, but Jesus Christ is able to raise the dead. Amen? He's able to fix anything. So whatever's going on in your life, you've got to learn to give it to God. 